Not long ago, my friend Claire said, Jeff, you really got to get a chance to connect with this woman, Edie Hand. She is a woman of true grit. She started a series interviewing women of true grit. She's written a book about women of true grit. And the more that I learned about her, the more that I found somebody that was a perfect fit for the Unbeatable Podcast. You see, this podcast is all about interviewing regular, ordinary people that have gone through incredible loss like Edie, have gone through incredible hardships like Edie, and bounced back and been resilient and learned how to be a better person because of it. You're going to love this episode with Edie Hand, a real woman with true grit. These stories of triumph over adversity will help you handle your toughest days in life and become unbeatable. Edie, thank you so much for joining me on this episode of Unbeatable. I am so excited to be here and to share pieces of my story with you too. Yeah, I'm glad that you're joining me. You're, uh, I'm connecting with you, by the way, just from the other side of the Chattahoochee River. I live over in Georgia. You're coming to, to me from a studio in Birmingham. And I'm glad we got a few minutes to hang out with each other today. Oh, me too. It was a pleasure. And to have a little insight into the person you are. It makes a difference when you get ready to share a piece of your heart. Yeah. I've been doing a little cyber stalking about you, and I'm so impressed by what I've heard. Um, <laughs> so before we actually get into the meat of this interview, I just got to ask you, because I stumbled across this quote, do you have your pearls on? Do you got your sword up? Are you ready for this interview today? I am ready. I got my pearls on right here and I am ready for this. All right. <laughs> yeah. Um, I really, really uh, got inspired by just getting to know you and some of the stories that you've been through, some of the stories that you're telling right now, you're, you're an amazing storyteller and you're um, encouraging people um, through women of true grit. We're going to talk about that whole series, the book that you've got coming out and all of that and a few, um, but let's go back. And I mean, way back, let's talk about your grandmother and the influence that she had on you and how she helped you become a woman of true grit. Oh, thank you so much, Jeff. I, even today while I was here in this studio and I was cooking up some buttermilk biscuits and chocolate gravy is my grandmother, Alice, taught me how to bake. Uh, she taught me how to have good manners and yeah. to drink my tea and put my little pinky up in rural All right. West Alabama. But the important things I learned about her that helped me get through life was she taught me. She said, sometimes in life, Edie, you're going to have to go around a curve and you don't think you can get around it, but you can. And sometimes you're going to fall in a mud hole. And you're going to have to get up and wash it off, girl. But remember, there is always another ride as long as you're on this earth. And you can do hard things. And if I'm not here to remind you, you will hear me in your mind and feel me in your heart. Yeah. Everyone needs somebody like your grandmother, Alice, in their life, reminding us about the mud holes. In fact, there's uh, uh, listeners right now that are in the mud hole and not sure how they're going to get out of it. Um, and they need to hear from your grandmother, Alice, that you'll get out, you'll wash yourself off and you need to just keep on going and learn some resilience along the way. Right? Exactly. You know, I I've got a PhD in living. I'm well educated, but I, <laughs> right? I don't have a PhD, but I yeah. do have one in living and, uh -huh. you know, learning what you really want to do and finding that passion, what I found from her was that comes in different seasons of life. Yeah, yeah. And I'm, I'm in my seasoned years and I feel that I have been refreshed and yeah. that, that I have been spared to share these stories. But not only for the first time, I am sharing my own story um, in a book to... Um, to let everyone know that it's not always easy yeah. things that get tossed at us, but we have to learn to apply those tools of life. And sometimes you learn them from other people. Sometimes you learn them from the experiences in life. And um, certainly from my grandmother, I learned about how to listen better. 
yeah. listen better in my lifetime and know that I am not alone, even though I feel like it sometimes by losing well, so many of them. So, young. yeah, you you had uh, you've had a pretty amazing past with uh, as a successful author and advertising company. Um, and in the entertainment industry. And for you, this goes back to very early on. So tell everybody how you got involved in the entertainment industry as a teenager. Well, I, I grew up with um, one of the most famous icons around him in the world, Elvis Presley. And Okay, so I need to make sure that people heard that <laughs> that are driving right now and listening to this podcast. Your cousin was the famous Elvis Presley. That's right. Yeah. Our grandmothers so, were sisters. All right. And these were two Southern ladies. Uh, my grandmother, Alice, and Minnie May. I was named after her. Edith May was my name. All right. I go by Edie. But, um, and the first time I remember that my grandmother took me to Graceland, um, it certainly was near a holiday. Uh -huh. And I was fascinated with a place like Graceland. You can imagine this is back in the late 60s and it was magical. Yeah. Um, we just to be there, be a part of uh, very few people that were there. I had another aunt, Aunt Delta, that was living there at Graceland. And sometimes Elvis wasn't even there, but this particular time he was. And I remember him coming into my uh, the grandmother's room and they were dipping snuff. These are two old ladies. <laughs> Southern ladies dipping snuff. Dip I snuff. love it. Yes. I, I mean, with black gum toothbrushes, yeah. you know, that cleaned mm -hmm. the teeth up after they dipped the snuff. And they had aprons on and they had pockets in their aprons. So, uh, and I would bring extra ones from the farm. My grandparents uh -huh. had a very large farm and we would put them, we didn't have this, as many Ziploc bags or different things yeah. like you have today. So we'd put them in saran wrap. And put them in the refrigerator, and Elvis would uh -huh. say, "Well, I know uh, Alice and Edie are here because mm -hmm. we have sweet gum toothbrushes in the refrigerator." Uh, but meeting him was very special. I remember my grandmother saying when he walked into uh, Minnie's room, he said, "Well, what are you ladies doing?" And I had not met him personally, mm -hmm. um, and I jumped to my feet because I was sitting in the floor, and. I was fascinated. I was going to reach my hand out and shake his hand, and he pulled me to him and hugged me. That's um, how it's supposed to be. And he said, yep. this is the way we, we hug our cousins in the South. All right. And uh, I knew right then we were going to, I was going to like this guy. And yeah. he was not, he was a big star then. Uh, and I loved how he had got Aunt Minnie this big red wingback chair yeah. in her room. Yeah. She was poor and you know, so poor. And he said, but one day we're going to have a big house on the hill and I'm going to buy you a wingback chair. And, and the gifts that he gave his oh, yeah. mannerisms. And I learned from him that day too, about, he understood he was very handsome, but I remember my grandmother saying this to him. She said, now Elvis, you know, you're too pretty to be a boy. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, these are very plain spoken Southern yeah. women and they all would laugh and that's what I loved about it. We were all just very genuine and he was too. And he, I remember him just sitting down on her bed and just loving seeing her happy. Yeah. And, and again, I happened to be around when they gave a yacht to St. Jude Children's Research wow. Hospital. And I got to meet, yeah. um, that was when Danny Thomas was there and I met his yeah. little daughter, Terry Thomas, um, and years later, we became very good friends. And she is my son's godmother. And yeah. she lives in Beverly Hills, California. My son lives there in Burbank. So it's a full circle between Elvis, the entertainment world. My uncles were incredible singer-songwriters, uh -huh. uh, wrote hits for Tammy Wynette, George Jones. Uh, so I grew up with simple living singing on the front porch that wrapped around a, a country white Victorian house. And it was simpler times. And even Elvis, I remember two times that he came on 4th of July to sit on the front porch and make music yeah. was that I learned about walking with the giants at a young age. And what yeah. was important was you had to work hard to achieve greatness, but you had to work even harder to achieve extraordinary yeah 
Well, Edie, you mentioned just before we started recording about Elvis and how he really paid, uh, you know, helped people, especially St. Jude, um, and the influence that had on you. By the time you meet him in the 1960s, he's the king of rock, right? Like everybody knows who Elvis is worldwide. And he's famous for his generosity. I mean, the stories still circulate today about the Cadillacs that he gave away and the incredible amounts of, you know, donations that he made. And it sounds like he left a real big influence on you by his generosity, not just by how big his personality and his superstardom was. Absolutely. I mean, just to see someone with that kind of heart. I mean, I have pieces of jewelry that I have that he bought in Hawaii because he loved uh, being in Hawaii and I, oh, the course. crystals were big back then, you know, so I had the mm-hmm. crystal necklaces and earrings. I actually get them out every Christmas and get all dolled up and put them on. Oh you know? yeah. And all right. So Elvis Presley style. I hear you, you know, and it, I, I, I see that today that it helped me to want to, I thought, wow, one day I want to grow up and do that. I want to give back and make a difference in my life. And, I remember him telling Uncle Vernon one day in the kitchen when he said, you know, she's smart. She's going to grow up and do great things. She's going to speak to the masses, whereas I have sung to them. Really? Wow. Elvis said that about you. Yes. How about that? And my my grandmother always said that, and I I didn't quite get it. I certainly get it now. Yeah. And, And I realized that even though, you know, Elvis didn't get to live, to be very old. And and I gave up all three of my brother's young ages. And I learned as I grew older to love harder and stronger and deeper. And it gave me more of a compassion for my fellow man. And I wanted to do something with the gifts I had been given. And I I saw that I had a gift for hooks in the advertising agency, Uh hooks to get brands done and never did I ever dream that I would write a book and there's less 35 of them. Right. And it's not about writing them. It's if you've got something to say. And then then this last part of all of this with my family was it's what I'm supposed to do now is to take all of that was learned and create something good to give back. Well, I want to make sure that listeners heard what you said just a few minutes ago, because Though you were around uh, uh, entertainment royalty growing up, it didn't come easy to any of them. And certainly nothing was given to you. You worked really, really hard to build an advertising agency, to write a lot of successful books, to start the entertain or to be successful in the entertainment industry but also life through some hard knocks your way. So you just mentioned some of the loss. But you went through a lot of grief. You went through a lot of loss. Can you just describe a little bit of that for the audience? Mm. You know, in, in what I do, I, and I learned from my grandmother, was I use the metaphor of a pearl. And it takes a speck of grit mm-hmm. to form that beautiful pearl through irritations. And I have used that to think we as women of what I write about have gone go through irritations to come to where we are purposeful meant to be. Yeah. And I can tell you that I, I gave up my brother, David, when he was 19 years old, he was killed Mm -hmm. in a car accident. My brother, Philip was killed 10 years later, 23 in a car accident. And then another 15 years, my brother, Terry was stricken with an aneurysm in the middle of the brain tumor. And so my mother, my sister, I was the oldest of five care gave for him back when there wasn't a lot of caregiver yeah, right. um, on his 10 acres with his horses. And I watched him, this big, tall, good looking young man become a vegetable Yeah, before he left. And that, that's hard to see a man that's oh, so, man. To, to, to be a vegetable and could only blink. But before he lost his voice, he said, you tell such great stories. Would you tell our story one day Uh that the Blackburn boys mattered, that we loved life. And so I I wrote the last Christmas ride uh, 
is a, a novella about them to share what it was like growing old by growing young and telling their stories of riding horses with them from our horses of Trigger to Spotted Cloud to my yeah. brother Terry uh, being in love with our Avon lady and named his horse Polly. I mean, <laughs> you know, but just cute All right. kid things in the country that was very precious to me to ride horses in the afternoon yeah. and lie around and tell your dreams. No different today than to be able to hear other people's stories and to think, Maybe there's a piece of me in there. Maybe there's a piece of somebody yeah. else. But through that, it um, I didn't. I detached to be able to cope because I was a businesswoman, uh -huh. and I was then a mother uh, of one son, and I had to keep going. But not until literally forty years later that I did this documentary about the last ride. I wanted to honor the boys. Yeah. And I, I do have that up on my site. But I tell you this, I didn't do it for anything other than to help someone else that might have gone through a lot of great loss. Uh, and when I went to that cemetery and looked at all those graves there, yeah. my mother, my father, my three brothers, uh, and Link's father died. And I, I can say... I grieved for about 30 hard days mm. and it has changed me in a different way. Again, yeah. I'm re-listening in a different way. And I went through from that a deep betrayal of someone I deeply trusted. Uh -oh. that took a lot of money from me. Oh, and I'm sorry. All I'm saying is people can take things from you. If your listeners are hearing this, don't waller in it. Get up, put your pearls on, get your sword out, slay those demons. Yeah. They can't take their tools from you. Yeah. And I've been refreshed and God has given me more than I truly deserve at this season time of my life because I see all of that's being restored. Yeah. Wow. I was just thinking your grandmother, Alice, really was a woman of true grit, but your mother must have been a woman of true grit also because losing two sons, then a son with a major health issue and all of this land and all of that responsibility, and she steps in and she has to kind of take care of her son and his property and you and your sister, wow, that's an incredible amount of responsibility. A it lot is. of hard work. It is, but you know, she could not do it. So I did it for her. Yeah. So that made me tougher. So I my grandmother gave me enough grit for my mother yeah. and me. I remember I bet it her did. saying yeah. to me, um, your mother is not well. And Edith, you need to be strong and love her for who she is. Mm -hmm. Because everyone doesn't have what I have and what you have. And, you know, I get it now. And I actually love my mother different. Even though yeah. she's gone, I wish I could have told her that I get it better. Right. You know, in life, we don't sometimes get things until we go through other experiences. Yeah. But if we listen through these stories, maybe it can help us to get there earlier. I think it's good for the uh, audience to hear what you're saying, because you go through loss in life and somebody else goes through it. And maybe they're going through it at the same time that you're going through it. But two people don't go through it the same way. I've had a chance to be around a lot of loss, unfortunately, in the military. And the way that one person handles it is not necessarily the way that another handles it. Um, I don't ever want to judge somebody and say they're doing better or they're doing worse. It's just different. People are different. They handle loss different. And that, you know, because there she was going through losing her boys. Yeah. And you, you, you just can't, I can't even imagine what that yeah. would be like. Um, yeah. And then, um, so I honored her and my grandmother in this book in the dedication arm because you know I now understand her and as I'm getting older you know I, here I am you know in the 70s years of my life and I'm thinking I'm getting another 
act. I'm getting yeah. another opportunity yeah. to um, take all of these tools and all these life lessons to share with my sisters and yeah. brothers. I mean, what we have to do is help each other. And that's what I see is that, um, you know, you can either get lost in all of it or you can put your pearls on and get your sword out right. and keep going. And, and yeah. that's what, I mean, I don't say I'm great at it. I say that I'm, I'm able to do it. And I see that I'm able to be around extraordinary people because yeah. of it. Well, you have every, you really have all the qualifications to be an ambassador for women of true grit, not just because of the loss in your life, but because of the health issues that you've gone mm -hmm. through. Let me just say to the audience, not once, not twice, but four different times you've gone through cancer mm -hmm. And obviously you've survived. So can you describe what cancer has done to your body in the years and the resilience that you've learned facing another cancer diagnosis after another cancer diagnosis? That is a big question. Um, I think I learned to tolerate pain um, more than the average person. I, um, no one knows what another person suffers through yeah. to get through it, but you know, it wasn't as much of the physical as it was the mental for me, right. um, of just, I, I couldn't detach from that. Like I could from the deaths from losing your brothers watching and, someone else yeah, suffer that yeah. I love deeply with me, I just had, I'm telling you, running a business, um, raising a son and trying to be his cheerleader. Yeah. I don't think he would, could tell you that I ever missed many beats, uh, <laughs> that I, um, I worked from my hospital bed. I worked from my home. Good what it gracious. My body was, I lost a lot of my flexibility that I used to yeah. have. They used to call me the blonde with floppy fingers and I could bend my hands all the way all back. Right. And I was very flexible because I was a high school and college cheerleader. So I, I uh -huh. uh, but I tell you, I am now with a nutritionist that I feel is helping me to regain strength yeah. in my body. There's a new program here and a group of very well-educated young women that help women like myself with challenging health issues, like it's affected my heart. Yeah. So um, I'm now exercising, leaning out. I told them I'm going to be a really cute 80 year old by the time. All I'm right. Ready. That's so what I'm talking we, about. We, we are, we, I said, so we are, I'm stretching. I'm, you know, I am doing things that I didn't think I could do in the last six weeks that I'm doing again. And All right. Now in six months, what will this mean to get yourself in a better physical shape, leaning out, getting started? Now, my son's got a 10 pack and I tell him his mother tries to keep a two. <laughs> so but, you know, it's important. I mean, it really yeah. is. We, right. we uh, I'm just learning to eat differently. Yeah. Um, and feed my brain different. Uh -huh. So I'm I don't my uh, oncologist said. Well, you know, cancer is going to come back with a vengeance. And I said, well, I don't know. I'm, I'm thinking now I'm, God's got a different plan in my life. That's right. And, tell and, and tell so cancer. I'm just saying, who knows? I don't know. When it is my number, I'll be gone. Right. But they can't say I didn't. That's, you put I up a fight. I didn't have enough grit to get That's through right. it. <laughs> I was going to say, tell cancer that they're, they're dealing with a woman of true grit. Um, so you... First time you were diagnosed, it was kidney cancer. You lost a kidney because yeah. of it. In other words, it was pretty severe. Talk about the next couple of times that you were diagnosed and well, what that you, did to your body. I'll tell you this. When I had my kidney removed, it, they didn't have the technology and ability yeah. to do it. They sliced me half in two. So I couldn't walk for almost a year. Good. And I was only... Um, in my late twenties. Mm -hmm. So they didn't think I was going to make it. 
and at that time, and I lost a child. And the, I, I, they hmm. didn't, I had just been married a couple years, and Link's father was ten years older than me, and we thought, well, I would just wouldn't have children. Yeah, and right. I had already started my company. What it did to my body, um, I had to learn to walk again. Wow. Uh, but I was just determined I was going to keep moving and going. And it took a lot of therapy. Uh, I went through a lot of radiation. I went through different uh, early on chemos were mm -hmm. a lot tougher than they are. They've come up with some different ways today. Yeah. But when it's a clean, like when I went through breast cancer, um, mine was not as um, invasive because they got it early and I yeah. didn't have to have any chemo. Um, and then I went through, you know, I, everything I've gone through with my bladder and this a couple times. And when I had a complete hysterectomy, um, when you get in there and can get it early, you don't have to go through as much radiation yeah. does burn the body bad. And oh, yeah. I have a lot, I tell them, I said, underneath these clothes, my body looks like a roadmap <laughs> to China. <laughs> I have a lot of scars. I bet. What it has done to my body, it weakened my immune system. Yeah. Um, but I'd say I'm doing pretty great right now, yeah. considering it all, because I am, I've looked for ways to help my life. Since I had the opportunity to stay here, I haven't always. I'm just telling you, in the last, in the last year, I have found a refresh button in doing this work. Wow to give these stories to other women. Yeah. And I see that young women, I, I work with college students. Um, I speak at colleges. I see it doesn't matter. Age is a number. Yeah. It is what's within here. Right. And what you can do to help your body to get strong. You really need to seek professional help to get someone to help find the right fitness program and uh, nutritional program for yourself. That's yeah. so important yeah. when you go through cancer. And uh, I know I'm blessed to be here. I have my one sister left, but she's going through some horrific health issues now that mm. I am really hoping that, and she's only, you know, she's uh, in her uh, later fifties, but it's, you just don't ever know. Yeah. I mean, I, and she says, how in the world, you just a tough one that you keep hanging <laughs> in there and you're here, yeah. but maybe it is part of what you and I do is when you experience these unimaginable walks, I think we are to share them yeah. to people. They too yeah. can do it. They too can do hard things. Yeah. You're getting healthy. Uh, you're getting stronger and more flexible. You should warn your neighbors. Hey, don't be surprised if you see her in the front yard turning backflips pretty soon um, because she's getting back to her college days. Um, come don't on, be long you now. know. <laughs> well, yeah. I, you know, I tell Link, I said, I'm getting ready to come check you out in Hawaii. Yeah, so here you go. That's right. Hey, cancer ravaged your body. So let's talk about this miracle baby, because you really shouldn't have been able to have a child, but you were able to have a son. Link is doing very well. So yes. describe a little bit about Link and what he's doing now and where people can see him when they watch television. Yes. Link is my heart. Um, he is a fine young man. I love how he loves people. I love how he treats people. Um, and he is an actor. He is a working actor. Um, he started out uh, doing opening acts to make his money with Jimmy Kimmel. So he, right. he knows what it's like being yeah. on television, doing skit. But he's had the opportunity to do uh, numerous films over the years. But mm -hmm. what he's doing now, he's very excited about on NCIS Hawaii. He's a new character called Charlie One. If you right. check him out um, on Charlie One, um, he is filming in Hawaii. I won't get to see it. It's my first Christmas that I'm not going to get to be with my son in his life. Oh. But we will talk and FaceTime. But I just love that he's able to do what he is passionate about. Yeah. And uh, his wife's a singer-songwriter. So he is, um, you know... It's not 
easy to go into these worlds of entertainment. Of course, yeah. All the time. But I see that my son is um, on a new path, and I see yeah. greatness is coming his way. Yeah. Well, thank so, you for asking. Sure. I mean, the entertainment industry is brutal, but if you want to see brutal. Link um, in his new television role, just go watch NCIS Hawaii and look for Charlie Wan, and you'll see um, Edie's son Link out there. Well, and you know, he reminds me of you with what you're saying of the toughness of a warrior and, and the fitness and what certainly in your background and the fact that he's playing a, a Navy SEAL detective yeah. and you got to be a pretty tough guy. You got to be a tough guy to be a Navy tough SEAL. Tough guy yeah. to do that. And of course and he has friends. They actually there in Burbank where he lives, his base uh -huh. has been there is that uh, I, I knew that a lot of, of the guys that were in Navy SEALs worked there with ABC. Yeah. Uh, Disney has had given them an office mm -hmm. space and things. So I was very impressed that Link worked out with them at the gym, as they say. Nice. The guy in the gym. All so, right. You know, they all help each other. Yeah. 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 Um, before we get into what you're doing now, and I really want to focus a lot of time on the Women of True Grit series that you're doing right now. I want the listener to get to know you just a little bit better. So I got this hypothetical question that I'm asking all of the guests this season. Let's say, Edie, you got no responsibilities at home, no responsibilities writing, speaking on television and, uh, you know, marketing and advertising. You get a full day. You can go anywhere you want to go. You can do whatever you want to do. There's absolutely no rules, no limits, no work that needs to get done. And you can do it with anybody you want. Where do you go? What do you do? And why? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, a full day where you can just basically do whatever you want. Well, I I do love to read. And All right. I, I love to go. Um, sometimes I, I take a drive and go back to North Alabama where I used to ride horses mm -hmm. and uh, uh, walk around the old campus. And just I remember the beautiful people in my life. That's yeah. one of the things I do. But if I could do this, is one of my close friends, um, Colleen, I like to go because she likes to fine dine. So I like to go have a good meal. All right. And um, I, I enjoy that. And I enjoy a good massage. I like to go and unwind and meditate. And uh, th that's, that helps my body. It helps my mind and the fellowship to have a nice meal. Mine is really pretty simple. <laughs> yeah. Actually, that sounds great. Walking down memory lane, having a good meal, getting a massage, reading a good book. Wow. That sounds like a great day for just about anybody <laughs> that I know. Sounds like a, a lot of fun. Um, for a lady who has had a prolific writing career, you're now writing some of the stories that fascinate me, some of the stories that I want to read. And honestly, for the audience out there, you got to hear about some of these incredible women that Edie is telling, helping them tell their story. So let's talk about the Women of True Grit series. Where did that come from and, and describe how it kind of became what it is today? Mm. This was about 20 years ago. Um, I... Again, the Women of True Grit came. I, I really was a big John Wayne fan, and I loved. Uh, he was a guy. Yeah, I'm, and and I'm a big movie buff. Now I do. I will go movie fun, and you know, as they call it, I'll go watch three movies. And uh, so that's another day. But to me, I that was part of reliving what I love so much about my grandmother mm -hmm. and. I love hearing women's stories that if I thought if I have been through all this, there's got to be others yeah. that have been through difficult things, no matter their walk of life. So I've been privileged to walk with the giants in the music industry and in the film industry, um, in a lot of area in television all my life. So a friend of mine in Manhattan, she and I wanted to start the first woman in True Grit. Her name was Lucille Luongo. And she was the head of CATS Communications in the mm -hmm. marketing division, which is, you know, one of the largest companies in the country to um, 
distribute television. Yeah. You, and she and I started this with stories. We went to D.C. You know, we met with the president's uh, first lady. We met with heads of the first of many things. Uh, but she was stricken with brain cancer, and we did not get to finish this book. Wow. Mm-hmm. So the I was very distraught, and I thought, wow, I keep running into these closed doors. I'm going to be looking for another open one. So there was a young lady in Birmingham that couldn't get her book published, and she had written some great stories. I said, let me mm-hmm. read your manuscript. And then I had already Brandy written all of these so with um, um, with um, with my own, with Lucille. Yeah. So I wanted to, I thought, well, maybe I should just put these two together and do this book and let it. So we did the first Women of True Grit with this, and I had the privilege of interviewing Brig- the first woman decorated as a brigadier general, Wilma uh-huh. Bond. And here she is in her 80s and raised $10 million to open wow. the Women's Memorial at the gateway of Arlington yeah. Cemetery, telling 2.5 million stories at that time. And she hosted my first event at the Women's Memorial and carried the book. And so it was a start. And she, I loved what she said. She says, hey, I can still kick ass and take names. And right. I loved it. And I loved that all of these different women had their own attitudes. Yeah. And, um, but that was the first then I got sick again and had to wait. And then I went through another tough period with cancer and then the betrayal. And I thought, what am I going to do now? And a door opened for me with a friend of mine at FedEx for me to write a book for 17 leaders around the world. And Mr. Smith gave me the opportunity uh, to interview these women from Hong Kong uh, to uh, Memphis, Tennessee, where the All FedEx right. headquarters is. And it was a privilege to me to do this with one of their in-house yeah. ladies. And that sparked a fire in me. You know, I, I, I still got it. I can do this. And then when I turned 70, I thought, I'm going to do one more big book. Good for you. And maybe I'll do a documentary. I don't yeah. know. And I, I was, can you believe that I did two documentaries, wrote this book over two years, and now I'm doing vignettes here at ABC yeah. at the station every Tuesday and Sunday on the evening news of telling women's stories that matter in this culture, that from education to church to leaderships like FedEx to um a legally blind young lady I interviewed last week that uh, tap dances and teaches wow. other children that don't yeah. have money the importance of confidence through the arts. So I feel that with all of that, I have been given this opportunity. And that Women of True Grit mission, a friend of mine in Windsor, Canada, is the head of Inspire Hub. Uh, Mm -hmm. Carolyn allowed me to start a grit hub globally. And I thought, well, it's just, she said, well, you have to, people have to pay. And I said, no, I'm, I just think it needs to be free. And so Mm -hmm. we started this so women could privately be a part of a channel and a network of an eclectic group of women to hear what they needed to hear, learn new tools. So it became the true grit sisterhood and a gathering. So I see this is becoming bigger than I thought. And that the stories are 63 incredible stories to the yeah. head of American airlines, a uh, friend of mine that was at FedEx. Now she's the head of the environmental arm of that. And everyone knows somebody else. And it's just yeah. fascinating yeah. with these stories that these women are telling that I see even here at the station, people are talking about it, he said. And they and today, my friend Colleen that I told you about, we um, she helped me to cook. So when we finish right. with you, I'm gonna go have that good yeah, meal. All I right. yeah. after getting up at four AM. Yeah. <laughs> so I have learned a different value of friendship through these women. But now I don't put as many people around me. I'm very select who I allow in my mm-hmm. inner circle. And 
Not that I don't love people, because I do. But I, I don't have the hourglasses on the other end. So I want to use what I use and give of my time yeah. to what I want to do. I'll do podcasts I want to do. I'll do interviews I want to do. This is a time that I feel led is for me to be select, right. but yet come together with the right people and give the right messages because people need to hear what you and I have to say. Yeah. As long as we're here. That's right. Well, the first time I heard about you is from a friend of mine named Claire. Huge shout out to Claire. Thanks for recommending Edie. But Love Claire said, Claire. Jeff, you you need to talk to this lady. And she, her story alone is amazing. She has this unbeatable story. But more than that, she's tapped into this group of unbeatable ladies. And one of the things that I love about the Women of True Grit series is like this podcast, you're not just interviewing superstars that are really big name celebrities. You're interviewing everyday regular women who have gone through some incredible hardships and mm -hmm. they didn't get stuck in the mud, as your grandmother Alice would have said. They got up and they washed themselves off and they kept going. And we started this podcast for the exact same reason. I had the chance to get to meet a lot of really incredible people when I'm traveling and they hear my story. And then they'd say to me um, when we were talking after an event's over with, hey, can I tell you my story? Can I tell you what happened to me? And I finally heard so many of these that I thought, I want I want the whole world to get a chance to meet the, the amazing people that I've met. And you've had a chance to interview some incredible women who have mm -hmm. kind of paved the way for women in all walks of life. Ladies like that uh, helped pave the way in NASA and step, you know, one of the first women who will ever step foot on the moon. You've had a chance to interview them in the Women of True Grit series. But you also mentioned that you learn a little bit about resiliency by listening to their stories. So mm. can you tell our audience some of the things that you've learned listening to these incredible women? Yes, I'd be happy to, Jeff. I, you know, grit is great. Resilience is transformative is what it stands there for. There it is. Great, G-R-I-T. Great resilience is transformative. Is transformative. All right, I'm going to write that down. Write that on the wall. Um, to me, I, I am a woman of true grit because I, I learned how to be resilient. You know, I, I can tell you that you can probably identify with this being a one woman band um, <laughs> and uh, till you find people that believe in what you right. have, you got to have money to do this. Uh -huh. um, you certainly have to have creativity. Um, you got to have someone that can edit or you got to sit down beside them and help them edit. Yeah. And then you got to market. So all the areas I had, a little bit of information about and experience and knowledge that um, I knew how to find the right people that I thought. Mm -hmm. And when you get it, as a friend told me once, soon they'll just come to you. You know, but sometimes you try so hard to get to where you want to be. And then when you stop and you know that someone has a bigger plan than you do, yeah, it will all start coming to you. Yeah, And Claire is one of those people um, and through the company, she and I know a lot of the same people, is that um, the authenticity, um, the stick to um, it's okay to cry, you know, yeah. um, and I've cried a million tears. And at this stage of my life, I never thought I'd be alone. Um, and I'm finding some comfort in it now. Uh -huh. but, but I didn't for a long time. And I think that comes from listening to these other stories that I have learned that not just getting through hard things, but liking who you are and you got to become wow. your own best friend. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and I had to get that sword out to slay the demons to like me again Uh huh. because sometimes I made bad choices and I learned from those bad choices and I listened to some wrong people. 
and I'm more careful with who I allow in my circle from that. And you listen to, um, you just listen different and you behave different. Yeah. And I think that we draw to us what's needed to be drawn if we stay in that vein, because you know yourself, you're in this business of telling stories too. being a good storyteller. I, I created this of, because of some powerful friends of mine, women, that said, Edie, you should start through the Women of True Grit, yeah. the art of storytelling. Yeah. Of all from digital, you know, television, podcasts. How, how, how do you partner with the right? It'd be like you and I at an event and you were speaking and, and what could they learn from you and what could they learn from me? Or mm -hmm. What could they learn from people with this kind of grit? Yeah. You know, and people are searching for this everywhere, Jeff. It does. I mean, I, I hear it and I know you do yeah. too. You can't pastor a church or different things you do and not hear the worst of the worst, yeah. the low of the low and the high of the highs. Right. But you have to find a formula that works. And for me, my greatest thing has been my amazing grace that I have been given. Yeah. Yeah. You just, I wrote this phrase down while you were talking, you described how you learned how to live with yourself and even like yourself again, after making some mistakes, man, I've been there. Everyone who's listening to this episode has been there. They've made some big mistakes. They have some parts of their life that they really, really wish they would have never done. And sometimes people can just get stuck there and they have trouble moving beyond it because not because the mistakes were so catastrophic, but just because they let themselves down. Getting let down by people around you hurts. When you let yourself down, it hurts really bad. So what, it, what did it look like for you to learn to like yourself again, learn to mm. move beyond some of those mistakes of your past? Took me a while. Um, but you know, I look in the mirror and I see the reflection I might not be as lean as I used to be. I might not be as <laughs> not as flexible as you used to be one time, right? Not as flexible as I used to be, but I still got a great brain. I still look good enough. I can still do enough. Uh -huh. And as long as I can do all of that, I am of value on this earth. Yeah. And I matter. And so do you. Yeah. So your listeners, I come to see in that mirror that I matter and I, and I'm going to keep going. I, I don't know where I'm going just yet, all of it, but I'm on that one year plan. All right. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm, I'm, uh, I don't know where I may end up or, but you know, it's like one day at a time today yeah. has been a day filled with four things that I didn't think I was all right. Be doing, but it worked out just fine. Yeah. And, and I'm telling you, it's been a pleasure to be a part of. I hope people will take time to listen to some of these women's stories yeah. from CC one to like she told me, she said, you know, Edie, I grew up in the church and by George, my mom and dad expected me to sing. <laughs> you know, they say, well, you right. going to have a singing career. Yeah. Well, it, well, by George, if I didn't, I was going to be talked uh -huh. to. But she said, look what happened to me by listening. Yeah. And if you have those right people around you, doesn't mean she made all the right choices either. And she'd tell you that. Yeah. In the same way, I think in in listening to a lady that I interviewed that was the first African-American lady to have a wine, uh, on her own wine vineyard. And, she, and she's in Oregon. And she said, I did this because I loved wine and I love the process mm -hmm. of entrepreneurship, but it wasn't that I'm a drinker. I do love to sip it, but she said, I knew I, I was passionate about it and could make money as an entrepreneur yeah. and help my sister that is a disabled. And she has all these, um, different, uh, units set up for disabled adults. So she has more money. She can do more for this disabled yeah, adults yeah, because she yeah. had a passion because she grew up with a sister. Everybody has something behind them. If you think about it, that's driving them of what they want to do and yeah. leave behind. And 
every woman's story that I have from a woman starting at the age of 50 says, I'm, I'm going to be a comedian at 50. All okay. right. At 50. You know, yeah, go, go for it. You know, go. Um, and just hearing all these, I mean, from, you know, it's tough in entrepreneurship, but to hear what some of these women went through yeah. to get to where they are. Oh my goodness. I mean, I could go on and on, but when you hear one of the women grew up in a cult situation and was uh-huh. abused as a child, mm. an adult, by the leader of their organization. Oh, but she found a way because of her amazing grace to now she is speaking and doing international media work. Yeah. And to go through that kind of mind messing up only, yeah. you see what I mean? Yeah. These stories of how she, how they use their tools of their gifts and we all get those gifts in life, right. but you have to recognize what they are. And there are women like that, or that had been trafficked and how they overcame it. Even by me working with FedEx and seeing a division and how they wanted to build homes for uh-huh. women to feel like they had a place to go home. You know, you sometimes you don't even, Mary Eisenhower that I interviewed, you know, her grandfather was the late great president Eisenhower. She wow. said, I never thought I'd be giving toothbrushes and toothpaste to kids overseas just yeah. to get a smile on their face. And yeah. she said, my grandfather told me when I was a little kid, one day this will interest you. Mm-hmm. And now she's running it. And you just see extraordinary everywhere. Yeah. That blesses me. I learned this from one of my oncologists, Dr. Patrick Darby. A friend, friend helped me bury 18 of my family members makes me emotional to think about it. But it's not, we're just passing through here. We all are. Yeah. But he said, Edie, what I have learned from you is I'm going to pass this back to you is you were one of the first pearls on my heart that I thought about people that had touched me as a patient, as a friend. Yeah. And so I feel that I have been filling up my heart. It might've had some issues, but I'm filling it up with pearls around it yeah. of these beautiful stories. Well, your stories have been out there on Alabama public television. They've been out there in a couple of other formats, but you package them together in a book that's going to be released in March called women yes. of true grit. And in just a moment, I want you to describe for people where they can find that book. In fact, we'll put a link to the book. Um, if people are interested in picking it up, But really what I've tried to do over the last couple of minutes is just ask you, Edie, to describe resilience. Because you called grit, great resilience is transformative. And when people hear the word resilience, I want to make sure they understand what they're hearing from you. I think of this imagery of a rubber ball hitting an immovable or an uh, immovable object. You take a rubber ball and you throw it on the ground. And when that ball hits the ground, it starts to get smashed and it gets disfigured a little bit because the ground doesn't move. But then the ball has something inside it that causes it to spring back and to spring up. And maybe the direction of the ball changes a little bit, but the ground doesn't stop the ball. The ball reacts to the immovable object and really these women of true grit that you've been interviewing, they're just ordinary gals like you that have gone against some incredible um, obstacles, some immovable objects. And instead of being deflated by it, instead of being crushed by it, they've been able to bounce back and and sounds like bounce back stronger and better because of it. And it's early 2023. And all of the audience is going to face some hard times, maybe some immovable objects in their life this year. And I wonder if you could just give them kind of wrap this episode up by giving them a piece of advice or two that you've learned from these women of true grit that you've interviewed. How do you react? What do they do when they hit those hard times, those immovable objects? They didn't choose it. They didn't ask for it. But life just threw them a bad way. And now could you be kind of Grandma Alice to these folks and give Mm -hmm. them a piece of advice or two before they even get into those mud holes that they're going to face in 2023? 
Wow. First of all, I want to thank you for being a good listener. Um, resilience. Um, wow, my grandmother said it well, and I will speak to your audience to say that you have to realize that you are worthy. Yeah. And that you have to pick yourself up because no one else is going to do it. Right. And when you think you can't and you want to just lay down and die and you're done, if you would just listen, I tell you something that gave me that resilience too was Girls with Swords by Lisa Bevere. And I listened to her audio tape that told me that deep down inside of me, in the same way with each of you that are listening, there is a lion within you. Hmm. And that lion can roar and it can come out. And it can only come out if you become a warrior. Mm -hmm. And you have to put your pearls on and get your grip on and get your sword up because mm -hmm. life is filled with those unstoppable, unthinkable, unimaginable situations. Mm -hmm. And you can either lay down and die or you can get up and use it to make you better, yeah. stronger, and tougher, and believe it or not, softer. Yeah. Never but, stop. Yeah, this is great advice. Um, because you've learned this by by going through it yourself, Edie. Mm -hmm. You've learned this by listening to other women go through it. And for the audience, when you face that hard time this year, and it's coming for all of us, I hope you're listening to Edie right now. You have inside you what it takes to face that challenge and to get up and to keep going. So don't lay down. Don't throw in the towel. Don't quit. Get back up dust yourself off and be unbeatable, unbeatable like Edie, unbeatable like these women of true grit that she writes about and that she interviews. And pretty soon somebody's going to be asking you the questions that Edie's asking others, like how did you handle it and what and trying to learn from you. So Edie, um, people who are interested in the book, and by the way, I'm just going to challenge every listener, go out and get a copy of this book. Just read it this year as stories to encourage you that if these ladies can get through what they went through, then you can get through what you're going to go through. But tell people where they can find the book when it releases, when it's released in March. Well, they it is for pre-sale now. They have it out on Amazon.com. They All have right. it on Amazon. Uh, they went to my site, edhand.com. It's linked to everything. And uh, we have all the sites, uh, the books a million dot com, right. Barnes and Noble. Okay. Uh, I think you can find it. Uh, they have the ebook and this book. And uh, Jeff, I, I'm going to make sure you get an early copy of this. Well, book. thank you. I was just going to say, we'll make available uh, the links to your website, edhand.com and Thank to the you. book um, so that anybody who's driving right now, all you got to do is just check out the notes to this episode and you'll have a link to that out there. But I think what we'll do if it's out there already in ebook format is we're going to give away a free copy. So if you want a free copy of Edie's book, we'll tell you at the end of this broadcast how somebody, one of you can get a free copy of Thank her you. book. I just want to tell you, Edie, it's encouraging to hear from a lady of true grit like you, to hear from a lady who's been talking to a lot of women of true grit like you have. And I've been encouraged. I'm gonna. I'm looking forward to get, picking up a copy of this book and being inspired by some of these stories. Thanks for joining me on this episode. Thank you. And I look forward to maybe you and I and Claire having a cup of coffee. That sounds great. Maybe we can do that in your neck of the woods sometime. Sounds good. And Blessings. we'll see you later. Hey, everybody. As Edie was talking, I wrote this quote down. When she went through hardships, when she faced difficulties in life, they helped turn her into a better person. She said she learned to love harder, to love deeper, to love stronger because of it. And one of my goals for this week, just because of listening to Edie today, 
is I'm gonna try to love harder and deeper and stronger no matter how hard life is this week. I hope you were challenged. I hope you were really encouraged by listening to her and the women that she described during this episode of Unbeatable. Listen, I'm so much a fan of the series that she's doing, Women of True Grit, that I really do want to give you a free copy of her book. So for one of the listeners of the audience, the all you need to do to get a free copy of this book is just go to unbeatablearmy.com. If you're already part of the Unbeatable Army, you're already signed up and eligible for a free copy. If you're not yet a part, just go to unbeatablearmy.com. It's going to prompt you to give us your name and your email address. And for one of you, we're going to give you a free copy of her ebook, Women of True Grit. Thanks for tuning in for this episode. We'd love for you to go ahead and subscribe on your favorite podcast platform if you like what you heard today. We'd be happy to continue to give you some great content all week long. So why don't you follow us on social media? We're on all of the prominent platforms out there. Just search for at Unbeatable Podcast. In 2023, we're just going to keep giving you great guests that have true grit and have gone through some incredible things and been unbeatable in the process. Thanks for tuning in this week. See you next week.